So, Daft Punk. They're actually robots, you know. I made a video on them recently, and the reception on it from you guys was absolutely insane. Thank you all so much. In it, I mentioned that Discovery deserves its own separate video, and I was planning it later, but then I thought about it, and I said, eh, why not? Thanks for subscribing, everyone. The council is growing. Of course, as you probably already know, Daft Punk's Discovery is their second studio album after homework, and look to bring the duo to grounds and sounds previously not treaded before, creating classic songs along the way, some of which are still being played by DJs and radio stations. So, to welcome you all, or if this is your first time watching, and I guess since they're on my mind right now, I thought it'd be cool to dive into their second studio album, Discovery, and discover eh? some secrets and hidden things from the album, as well as cover some trivia that you might not know about. I found some crazy stuff. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Even if you aren't a fan, be sure to drop a like if you're interested. But without further ado, let's take a look at the secrets hidden in Daft Punk's Discovery. I'm thinking of where to start, but why not just start at the beginning? After homework, it makes sense to go straight to their next project like most artists do, but the duo didn't start recording for it until the middle of 1998, as they were still riding the waves of their previous album, and in 1997, they spent the year touring their Daff and Direct tour, which literally spanned all of 97. They recorded the album in their home, aptly titled The Daft House, which was just Van Altier's home in Paris. They even used the same equipment they used for homework, but the reason it sounds so different, stated by Bang, they wanted to focus on creating more packed and condensed songs, experimenting with different music techniques and palettes. Sampling was used to its fullest form on here too, but we'll get to that later. One More Time was among the first songs to be finished for it back in 98, but was quote, sitting on the shelf until 2000. I guess the 90s just didn't want it. They also did Too Long around that time too, but quickly decided that they didn't want to do just house. They enlisted the help of artists Rome Anthony, Todd Edwards, and DJ Sneak to make it stand out compared to the last project. As homework was rooted in a more Chicago house, raw texture vibe, Discovery aimed to be more focused, polished, and carefully crafted, even going as far to call it a concept album, with the songs reflecting their upbringing in the 70s and 80s. Jeez, an electronic concept album? Who would have thought? This was also the beginning of the Daft Punk as we know them today, sporting the now iconic helmets. Telling the press the duo had an accident at their studio, i.e. their sampler exploded on them on September 9th in 1999 at 9.09am and had to reconstruct their faces, turning them into robots. This was also the time they started putting LEDs in there, as they would light them while performing, but later turning them off as they were kind of hurting their eyes. The lead single being One More Time, released on the 30th of November of 2000, and if the funk was the breakout song, this would be the song that propelled them to superstars, being a commercial hit and critical hit, finishing high on both year and decade end lists, even placing a number 307 on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Songs of All Time list, Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger, released in October of 2001, and also did really well, and is now a staple in their discography. Like before I get lucky, if you said Daft Punk to someone, this would be the first thing to pop in their head. Actually, I'd I'd argue that even with Get Lucky, that's still the case. The track is centered around a sample from funk musician Edwin Birdsong, and when he asked them how they found his song, since it was pretty obscure, the duo told him that while record been searching one day, the cover just stuck out. Kanye West would later find the song while touring in 2006, as he reportedly heard it on the radio. The story goes, he asked his friend what that was, and he told him it was Daft Punk, and Kanye, never hearing of them up until now, thought it was so cool that he tracked them down and got them to work on his upcoming album Graduation for the lead single Strong. But back to Discovery, the album would release on March 12, 2001, and although receiving fairly positive reviews when it came out, over the years cemented itself as an electro classic. Most people look back fondly on it now, and put it up there as one of the greatest electronic albums period. The album peaked at number 23, and it took a whole 14 years to get there? <sighs> I get it though, at least Ram did okay. But the music isn't all the album gave us. Two years later in 2003, we would get Interstellar 5555, the story of the secret star system, an animated movie about four aliens in a band that get captured by mercenaries and converted to humans to perform. Made to visualize the album, the movie was a collaboration between Daft Punk and Japanese animation legend Leiji Matsumoto, who created the manga series Galaxy Express 999 and Space Battleship Yamato. I am not getting a break with these names, am I? Released in 2003, each track track serves as a chapter in the movie, as the songs score and reflect the scene for what's happening. If you had trouble picking up on the album concept from the songs alone, the movie, while also being a treat to watch, helped streamline things a little bit better. And the scenes in which the singles are being played, also doubled as the music videos for the tracks. Talk about a two for one. Apparently the movie costed about four million dollars to make, which the boys paid out of pocket and took almost three years to finish. They had a bilingual friend translate for them, which although would have been fun to see, made the process even longer. But if you haven't seen it and you're a fan of theirs, it's obviously recommended as it's really fun to watch. 
Now sampling in music is in a weird spot, as it's often seen as either really praised or really shunned, and I'm not gonna get into that debate here, maybe another time, and most people know, but maybe you didn't, that Discovery delves a lot in sampling to get its sound, but how much does it really? If you don't know what sampling is, it's when you take an already existing song or sound and then transform it or apply it into your own work in some way. They did it before on the previous album too, but not to this extent. There's a lot of sampling done on here, more than you'd think, and the duo did an amazing job taking something and making it completely new and original, but that's the thing, they're too good at it. When making the album, the duo looked into really obscure places and sources to find some unique things, but that didn't stop the listeners from picking it apart, and when the album came out, fans were quick to dissect and call out samples used on the album, but Daft Punk insisted that the album uses minimal direct sampling, as the samples were re-recorded in-house or done in a way to make it sound like a sample when it really wasn't. There's a lot of examples I can show you, but to make it quick, I'll show you the bigger tracks. Can he do this without getting slaughtered by DMCA? The opener samples the song More Spell On You by Eddie Johns from 1979. Three parts were taken, the first one 19 seconds in, and another at 22 seconds. And the last one at 24 seconds. And together, chop like this. And a second like this. Pretty cool, huh? Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger also samples the song Cola Bottle Baby by Edwin Birdsong, mentioned earlier, but instead of the sounds being bunched together near the beginning, the first bit is the stretch at the beginning, and then skips all the way to the end of the song to get the blend. Now hearing the original, it may sound lazy, but if you listen closely, you'll hear that although they used a loop for a basis, they took that and cut it up throughout the whole track, taking it apart and putting it back together again, making new loops. That's real work, but always goes unappreciated. Did you know about the secret samples in High Life and Face to Face that took almost a decade to find? No, that's not an exaggeration. The two songs finally put under the spotlight by fans to try and find their source. But for the sake of the video, I'm just gonna do High Life. High Life's sample wasn't found until 2009 and was uploaded to YouTube by the Sample Edition, previously known as Ibanza, who made a video of them putting the sample back together in Ableton, but they credited another person named Love in Mind for actually finding the original song. Your efforts were not in vain. This is probably my favorite chop on the entire album, and whenever I think of amazing sample work, this one always comes to mind. The original track is Breakdown for Love by the group Tavares. They pull from all over the song, and the cuts are broken down and put back together so seamlessly. Let me show you what I'm talking about. First sample plays at the first and a half minute mark. Yep, that's it. The next at 138. The next back at 36 seconds. And then the last one jumps back up to 1 minute and 17 seconds. And put together sound like this. Goosebumps every time. This video by Brian's Red was the original video I watched all the way back when. And if you want to see him properly break it down and go more in depth, definitely give it a watch afterwards. It's actually insane. If anyone tells you sampling is not an art, just show them this video. Holy smokes. Yes, this album is a marvel to behold, if electronic beeps and boops are your cup of tea, and with each passing year, it's amazing that it's been able to stand the test of time as an electronic disco record that just doesn't age. Well, some parts do, but I choose not to see people still back and forth on whether this or Ram is their best work, which they both do different things, so it's pretty much up to preference, but with this album being one of their benchmarks, it's cool to look back on and see an album such as this be revered in the way that it is, and I think as the years go by, the album will continue to be a testament to electronic music and house music and show that even in a field of aging technology, you can still make something timeless. The remix album was kind of whack though. So yeah, what do you think of Discovery? Did you learn something new or are you already the Daft Punk encyclopedia? Leave a comment, I'd love to know. And subscribe if you enjoyed it. This was actually pretty fun to do and I have some other stuff planned, but you know what? If this video gets 50 likes, I will do another one of these Daft Punk trivia videos, probably on homework. I know a couple of things with that album too that I don't mind sharing, but that's only if you guys want it, really. But yeah, cue the outro! Jeez, the universe is just hitting me with those foreign names, huh? <laughs> Could you tell that French and Japanese are both my native tongue? I'll take the fall. It is pronounced Guy Manuel. There wasn't really anybody complaining about it, there was just people pointing it out. Except for one dude. To which I say, the dudes are coolin'. I'm sure a small YouTuber mispronouncing their names won't send them over the edge. Unless it does. But I appreciate the enthusiasm. If only somebody could be that enthusiastic about me. <sighs> See ya!